Hello everyone, welcome to the end of week 13 at TGIF. If you're watching this on a Friday, this is our third in a series of lectures, uh, third lecture for this week on the early 20th century and global Christian history. And today we're going to talk about Freudman, uh, Sigmund Freud, and we're going to talk about the Cristero War in Mexico, uh, the German uh, Christian crisis, with Hitler and the Spanish Civil War. And we'll be looking at some of the church state issues and church uh, church persecution or Christian persecution leading up to World War II. This is uh, week 13 of our uh, newly minted uh, introduction to Christian history. And uh, this is being taught for the first time this semester at Florida International University in the Religious Studies Department, and uh, this is a core requirement introductory course for our certificate in Christian Studies. If you're interested, please reach out to me, and I will uh, let you know more information about it. I'll be teaching this class again next semester, spring semester, at FIU if you're interested. So let's dive right in to our uh, material for today. This is uh, Sigmund Freud. I'm sorry, let me back up. This is Sigmund Freud. And uh, he uh, had a huge influence on psychotherapy in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Uh, just a couple things about him. Let me go back to this view. So uh, Freud lived from 1856 to 1939. He developed his psychological theories of the, of the origin of religion based on his own anecdotal experience of psychotherapy. This was actually before the Great War, but the impact was felt mostly after the Great War. And uh, he is considered to have a very reductionistic definition of religion. Basically, religion, according to Freud, is a child of obsessional, obsessional form of childhood neurosis. That's what he boils it all down to. Uh, he studied, uh, he had a, a, some obsessional patients such as the Wolfman, uh, who was un, uh, had developmental problems, and he believed that religion was the consequence of unresolved, unresolved developmental guilt uh, and being unclean, or the feeling of being unclean, which was associated in his mind with the anal phase of childhood development. He suggested that such religious behavior, uh, such as ritual cleansing ceremonies, uh, could be arise through similar obsessions. Uh, I'm only going to make one editorial comment here, that when you have a hammer, everything appears to be a nail. And so his thing was psychotherapy, and he found a way to explain religion uh, with psychotherapy, which uh, I find a bit questionable, but... He had a huge influence on Western culture. Uh, Freudian psychology did. And uh, some some would say that today, many aspects of Christianity has developed into moral therapeutic deism, a, coin, a phrase coined by Christian Smith, a sociologist at Notre Dame University. Moral therapeutic moral deism. So let's move on from Freud and... Let's take a look at uh, the the uh, Mexican Cristero War. This is a picture of a priest being executed by firing squad in uh, Mexico in the, around 1926. And so the the Cristero War takes its name from the fact that the priests when they were executed, would shout, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King, as they died uh, before the bullets. So this is kind of an unusual situation that not many people know about, so I'm going to talk for a moment about it. It also has implications for church and state relations. So in Mexico, there was a very powerful Catholic church going all the way back to the uh, the, the conquest and the arrival of the first 12 Franciscan 
um, monks in 1524. Uh, the Mexican church had become very powerful and was very politically connected. And uh, what I see in history is whenever you have a very powerful state church, you most inevitably have a back, a boomerang backlash coming, Again, especially in the modern modernizing period with sec secularism. Uh, the political systems and secular political systems do not like the church or any other religion meddling in their sphere. In 1857, a new Mexican constitution was established, acknowledging Catholicism, but limiting it, limiting, limiting its privileges. This is called anti-clericalism. A good and faithful Catholic political leader could be anti-clerical without being anti-Catholic or anti-religious. It just mean anti-clerical just means that the, uh, the the belief that priests and ministers should stay out of politics and stick to their lane of uh, preaching the gospel and providing hope to people. The Mexican Revolution came along and and actually took this level of anti-clericalism to a deep a new level uh, in 1917 with a new constitution that w went beyond anti-clerical and you could almost characterize it as anti-religious. Uh, there were prohibitions against public uh, dis building, religious buildings. There was prohibitions against uh, publicly wearing sacred uh, clothing like the priest in his garb or the nun in her garb. They were prohibited from wearing that in public. They were prohibited from wearing a cross in public uh, at one point under uh, the president Plutarco Elias Calles in 1924 who was a committed atheist and a socialist uh, it went even further and uh, he uh, shut down the celebration of the mass oddly enough the uh, Catholic Church responded by going on strike and refusing to serve mass uh, I guess the losers in this scenario were the the poor peasants who uh, we're trying to have faith in God. So this, uh, in 1926, this intense persecution of Catholicism by the Mexican federal government, which I remind you was a boomerang backlash from the, the, the wealth and power of the Mexican Catholic Church in the 19th century and its chokehold hold on uh, the political system. So now you have the political system, system has... Mexican Catholicism in a chokehold. Something similar happened in France, actually, at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th. Uh, so uh, a number of uh, poor Catholics, peasants, workers, uh, had had enough. And in 1927, they organized a resistance, resistance movement known as the Cristeros. In fact, they became an armed insurrectionary group trying to overthrow the Mexican federal government in the name of Christ. So the Spanish watchword was Cristo Rey, Christ the King, as I showed you in the earlier picture, and that's how they came to be called Cristeros. Uh, at one point, I think there were uh, something like, I don't remember the exact numbers but uh, i'm going to go with thirty thousand women were trained to fight and were fighting for catholicism against the federal government of course women had also fought in the mexican revolution and so this is uh, unusual in the sense that you have christians taking up weapons in an armed resur an armed resurrection that's kind of funny an armed insurrection against a federal government and uh, these are the Cristeras, the women who fought in the Cristero War. Uh, what eventually happened is by 1929, it, it was realized that this was unsustainable. And so there were a set of arrangements that were made between the Cristeros and the Catholic Church and the federal government, the Mexican government, with the help of the American ambassador, which gr granted concessions to the Catholic Church. Um, they agreed they agreed they were not going to change the constitution but they agreed to not enforce many of the provisions of the constitutions that were anti-catholic 
and that brought about a uh, peaceable resolution finally. If you want to read about this, there's a great fictional book, historical fiction, that's set in this time period in the state of Tabasco in Mexico, written by the British author Graham Greene, who actually, after a, tr a, tr a, a journey through Mexico, a few years earlier, converted to Catholicism because he was so impressed by the faith of the poor Mexican peasants. And he wrote a book called uh, The Power and the Glory. It's a, it's a bit of a difficult read, but it's a difficult story to tell. And actually, I got a lot out of it uh, further on into the book. I would highly recommend it. It also was made into a film around 1936, and then again in, in the 1961-62 period, it was made into another film with uh, in color with other actors. You can find them both on YouTube, free of charge, I believe. The Power and the Glory. The first one has Henry Fonda uh, playing the role of the his whiskey priest. I do not recall who plays that role in the 1960 version. But uh, this is an amazing period of Mexican history. And there's a lot you can say about it. Uh, you could talk about persecution, but you could also talk about Christians taking up the sword or the rifle and fighting to defend themselves and to claim their rights, however you may feel about that. Um, this brings us to the German Christian failure. Uh, so in this similar time period, basically the early 1930s, we're talking about here. Germany was in terrible, dire straits with uh, hyperinflation, a lot of uh, disillusionment because of it. The way the World War One, the Great War, had turned out. A lot of veterans came back from that war disgruntled and disillusioned, and uh, feeling alienated from the German uh, government and society, and. Uh, German Christians were also fragmented and divided, unable to agree among themselves about how to respond to the rise of the Nazi party. Um, so the, uh, the uh, Hitler began to rise to power in the early 1930s, particularly in 1933. And uh, the Nazi party was clearly anti-Semitic. It was clearly nationalist. It clearly wanted to expand its territory and and incorporate other german speaking ethnic german speakers into the nation uh so but this of course you must remember this is before the fact it's so easy to look back on history with 2020 hindsight and think well i would never have supported hitler but what if you were in 1932 or 1933 and you saw your country falling apart and a strong charismatic leader comes along promising to improve the situation, uh, that's a different story. That it requires a different kind of discernment than looking at it from uh, 90 years later in 2022. So the, there was a general failure of German churches to make a significant impact to hinder Hitler's rise to power. Of course, they had no idea, or perhaps they did, but they, they, they could not know that he would uh, the, the horror show that Germany would become under his authority with the incineration of millions of Jews and gypsies and other ethnicities, gays. Uh, so they could not have known that that was coming, although they might, uh, they might have discerned hatred in his rhetoric. Um, let he who has ears to hear, hear. So as his gradual move towards a reaffirmation of German imperial claims raised serious questions concerning the moral credentials of Christianity in Germany, the German question, the German Christian movement developed adopting a positive response to Hitler's program for national reconstruction and unity. In other words, many German Catholics and German Protestants uh, gave Hitler their enthusiastic support. Of course, many of them fought in the German military as well. This, uh, a note here is that, um, well, let me 
back up. German academic culture was also receptive toward Hitler's ideas. One of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger, gave Hitler his enthusiastic support. Uh, in his uh, address at the University of Heidelberg in 1933, this is a blemish or uh, certainly a stain on Heidegger's legacy. Other prominent Christian theologians gave their explicit support to National Socialism. Some scholars have argued that uh, it was partly Martin Luther's theological doctrine of the two kingdoms that permitted the rise of Nazism. This is controversial. It's just it's a thought, but you know there are people who have divided opinions on this. The two kingdoms theory uh, basically proposes that a radical separation between the church and state where the ch the state can do what it's called to do under God and the church does what it's called to do and they each stay in their lane. Uh, however, some people feel that this idea of the two kingdoms caused uh, Lutheran Christians to take a passive approach as uh, the German government came under not Hitler's sway and Karin on its way to hell. Uh, the Confessing Church arose uh, during this crisis. The Confessing Church was a, a, a church movement opposing the German Christian Church. The German Christian Church was not a denomination. It, it's just a, char a characterization of a movement of Catholics and Protestants, Reformed Lutherans, who were uh, getting behind Hitler. The Confessing Church opposed Hitler. Dietrich Bar uh, Bonhoeffer and Karl Barth both uh, became members of the Confessing Church, and they uh, met in 1934 at Barmen in Germany and wrote up a declaration opposing the Nazi movement and opposing Hitler called the Barman Declaration. This declared that the church could not adjust its ideas in the light of prevailing ideological and political convictions. In, tw in the fall of 2022, we've just had our midterm elections behind us. So maybe I should repeat that and we can all take a moment to ponder on its significance for us in the current situation. Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the rest of those who wrote the Barman Declaration and signed it declared that the church could not adjust its ideas, its theology, its mission in the light of the prevailing ideological and political convictions. Let that sink in. It had to remain faithful to its Christian roots as witnessed in the person of Jesus Christ and the text of the Bible. So let me uh, give you a picture here of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. 1906 to 1945, that indicates that he was only 39 when he died for his convictions. Um, Bonhoeffer. There's a number of books written about him. Uh, I've enjoyed reading his Cost of Discipleship many years ago. He has a uh, book on ethics. He has a book uh, called Christ the Center that I've had sitting on my shelf forever that I intend to read. He is a, an, he was an amazing man uh, and deserves to be read and considered and as a uh, giant of the 20th century. Um, so I'll leave you with that in terms of Bonhoeffer. Uh, so Hitler, the anti-Jewish attitudes and policies of Adolf Hitler were ultimately expressed, as you, all, all of you should know, in the Holocaust, a program of dis extermination which played a major role in shaping relations between Christianity and Judaism in the period after the Second World War. Hitler, sadly, had learned from the Armenian Genocide, which we talked about earlier this week, which happened in the context of the Great War and went unpunished. There was never any accountability for the Armenian Genocide, and even to this day, 
the, the nation of Turkey will not discuss it or admit it. Hitler learned from the Armenian example of the Armenian genocide that actions committed in a situation of total war did not attract international attention, and he assumed that his own genocidal plans would not attract international condemnation. The Holocaust had a strong impact on Jewish-Christian relations, which I've already said. It raised difficult questions about Christian complicity in Hitler's wartime policies and projects. And this brings us to the Spanish Civil War, 1936 through 1939. There are some scholars who claim that this was the op true opening of the Second World War, 1936, instead of the uh, German invasion of Poland in 1939 because the Spanish War had was hardly ending when the uh, invasion of Germany, the German invasion of Poland began. So it's almost one continuous war. In January 1936, a popular front, so-called popular front of Republicans, secularists, and communists, anarchists, won a sizable majority in the national elections in Spain. Rumors began to emerge of a further possible military coup to be led by General Francisco Franco, who had already been involved in the suppression of a local revolution in Asturias. Uh, the problem was this popular front was a democratically elected uh, government with the intention of being a liberal pluralist government, but they began to severely persecute and suppress Catholicism in Spain. And I'll talk some more about that in a moment. But this gave Francisco Franco, who was stationed in the military barracks, barracks in Spanish North Africa, it gave him the perfect excuse to launch a military coup and a military rebellion, which he did launch from North Africa, crossed over into Spain, and started to drive up from the southern part of Spain uh, to defeat the Republican government which I remind you was a democratically elected government. The civil war in Spain became an international affair very quickly. It became a proxy war between Germany and the Soviet Union. Uh, they tried out new technology and tactics. The most notorious incident was the bombing of the, the Basque village of Guernica by German fighter planes a famous painting uh, by Pablo Picasso is called Guernica, which uh, purpur purports to show this uh, this bombing. I wish I had uploaded a picture of the painting by Pablo Picasso, but I did not. You can look it up. Just do a Google for Guernica and Pablo Picasso, and you'll see the uh, famous painting that he did. The Republicans were supported by the Soviet Union. Also, international brigades of left-wing volunteers from the United States, from France, from Great Britain. Uh, there's a, in a, a great movie, I think, For Whom the Bell Tolls, I think is the name, book by Ayn Rand, that uh, deals with the uh, Soviet Union. And, uh, of course, the, the American actor plays the heroic role of staying behind to fight off uh, the... Uh, Phalangists, while the rest of them escape. Uh, it's a mixed story. The uh, um, it's a mixed story because there was definitely uh, pretty severe persecution going against the churches in Spain, particularly Catholics. Uh, churches and other religious buildings were burned by the the people of the Popular Front. The Catholic clergy were often murdered and laity. The Nationalists, which is the name of the uh, Francisco Franco Falange movement, now found it easy to represent themselves as the defenders of Christian civilization against communism and anarchy. Virtually all the Nationalist groups had strong Catholic convictions and connections. So the victory of the Nationalists in the Civil War in 1939 brought an end to state Spanish state hostility towards Catholicism. And remember what I said earlier, that uh, 
whenever you have an intense antipathy and perhaps even violence against a particular religious denomination or group that has been the state church, such as in Mexico in the Cristero War, under the Cristero War, in France with the Dreyfus Affair, and then the uh, laws, secular laws against religion in France, and also in Spain, you're usually talking about a strong uh, state church supported by the state, as was the case in Spain, that was uh, wealthy and very, very involved in controlling the political process. And so Jesus said, if you take up the sword, you will die by the sword. So I don't know whether that should even count as persecution for the sake of Christ. It's more of a backlash and reaction because the 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 uh, reactionary and conservative political role that Catholicism played in Mexico and France and in Spain. So let that be a lesson to you all, children. If you're going to follow Jesus, think twice before you get involved in politics and do it very thoughtfully and prayerfully and with counsel of others. All right, so good to talk to you. Next week, we'll continue with week 14, and we'll begin after World War II with Billy Graham and the neo-evangelicals, and eventually we'll get around to the, uh, the, the civil rights movement and Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the 60s, the Jesus movement. We'll talk about the moral majority, the election of Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. And uh, that'll take us up to uh, the following week will be our last week of lectures for this uh, history of Christianity. Thank you so much for your kind attention and involvement with me in this course. And uh, again, I hope you'll reach out and comment. Uh, you can comment in YouTube or reach out to me through Slack or an email or a Canvas message, and I'll be happy to engage with you about it. See you next week. I'll see you Monday morning. Take care.